You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the podcast. Today, we're going to ask the question, what does the Bible mean by the apocalypse? And we're talking with Martha Himmelfarb, professor of religion at Princeton University for over 40 years. She knows her stuff. Yeah, and her, her area of study is, is Judaism starting from the Second Temple period to up to Islam. And, you know, Jared, we keep coming back to the Second Temple period business, and we might sound like a broken record, but frankly, I don't really care. Do you, Jared? I think it's a good record to break. No. Um, because, you know, I, you know, I still have things we could do an entire, like, we could do Second Temple Judaism for normal people. This is what we could do, this whole right. thing, because it's such an important period of time. And again, if you want the details, you can go back to um, the Paula Fredrickson episode where we talk a little bit more in the intro about what uh, this period of time is. But basically, it's a time of of the Second Temple period, which is, well, that's it. What, what else do you have to know? You just, it's a, you just it's need your dates, named. 516 I mean, BCE to about uh, 70 CE. That's a roughly, you know, 600-year period almost, where the Second Temple was standing and a lot of stuff happened in Judaism that really directly affected Christianity. So, it's like a, a non-negotiable area of study if you want to understand Jesus and Paul and the rest of, the, just the early Christian movement. Well, and to, to that point, if you really want to understand what the Bible means by the apocalypse— you have to yes. understand Second Temple right. Judaism as well. It wasn't invented in the Book of Revelation. It's actually already in in the Hebrew Bible in our in the Christian Old Testament or the First Testament, but in this world of Second Temple Judaism, it it became more of a thing, let's say. And there might be some reasons for that, believe it or not. So, yeah, that that's a big thing. And and you know, she also mentions a term that I think has come up in other podcasts here, but Hellenism which is the the influence of Greek culture on Judaism, which was a really, really big deal, especially like beginning in the 3rd century BCE and very much in the 2nd century. And it caused a lot of tensions, uh, which led to something called the Maccabean Revolt. And she mentions this as well. Uh, there was a period of time in the early 2nd century where the the Greek ruler um, at the time, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, really really um, wanted to make Judaism very Greek looking, and with the support of some Jews, oddly enough, like all Jews weren't against this. Um, things like you know how, what you eat and and worshiping in the temple a certain way, and you know he sacrificed uh, a pig to Zeus in the temple, which is like five layers of like desecrating the temple. Um, but the Maccabees and a family called the Maccabees, uh, led by you know father and some sons after him, uh, they fought for independence, and that's where the uh, holiday of Hanukkah comes. So, but but I know that you know Martha she mentions the Maccabees somewhat in passing, but it's like one of these core moments and core, core periods in in the development of Judaism that had a real direct impact on the New Testament. So it's just good stuff to keep remembering. All these sort of terms and some of these dates are actually pretty important, I think. All right. All right, folks. Let's listen to this episode with Martha Himmelfarb. One could easily use the word apocalyptic to understand the Christian narrative. You know, that's a, a story about God and Jesus taking actions that are ultimately going to lead to a new age. That's certainly apocalyptic in some sense. The book of Revelation looks from a literary point of view, very different from the Gospels, but the content of the Gospels certainly could be described as apocalyptic. So, yeah, why don't we start with there, Martha? Why don't, why don't you um, d- define for us this word that, like, we use a lot, but that word apocalyptic, which may not mean it, – it's a word that might not mean what people think it, think it means. Right. Well, it probably does mean what they think it means, but it means other things as well. And it's – so, the Greek word um, – the, the Greek root, apocalypto, means to uncover something. So, it really means a revelation. And I think that the book of Revelation in the New Testament is the first work to label itself apocalypsis, a revelation – um, and that probably, you know, is very important for how the word has been received. And when most people think about apocalypse or apocalyptic, they think about the end of the world. But in fact, most of the, the well, most of my own work has been devoted to apocalypses that 
aren't so interested in the end of the world. They're more interested in other kinds of revelation um, about you know, the secrets of the heavens, the secrets of the cosmos, God's throne, um, the fate of souls after death. So, all well, Martha, of those back up. What, what do you mean, like end of the world? That when I think of that, I think when a lot of people think of that, they just mean like the explosion of the planet Earth and disintegrating into nothing. Is that is that what you mean by end of the world? Like that's well, physical think, destruction. So I think you know, I'm 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 trying to represent what, um, you know, ancient Jews and Christians think, and they certainly don't think the world is going to end in that sense. They think history, as we know it, is going to come to an end because God is going to bring it to an end, and, you know, they have different thoughts about exactly how that will, how that will come about, but they do imagine um, an era beginning that is, you know, totally different from the world that we're living in now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the differences between those two things. I think because of, you know, my tradition, those would have been conflated. I'm having a hard time pulling apart the end of the world from the destruction of the world. And even some of the language you used, I, I kind of automatically just, I think, put a bunch of baggage into that. So, when the ancients were talking about the end of the world... Could you maybe just flesh out a little more of what that might have looked like? I mean, for them? I think, you know, if you think of Daniel, so, you know, there are two apocalypses that made it into the Christian canon, only one that made it into the Jewish canon, um, Daniel in the Jewish canon and canon and Daniel in Revelation in the Christian canon. Um, Daniel, you know, has that picture of the four empires that will succeed each other ruling the world. And at the very end, there will be you know, the kingdom of the holy ones of the Most High. So, there will be a new world empire, and it will be God's empire. So, I don't think any kind of, um, you know, there, there, a lot of war had to take place, and presumably it brought some destruction with it, but the world didn't have to be destroyed and, and recreated there. So, if you, you know, if you follow the book of Daniel, you imagine um, major political changes, but you don't imagine that... Um, you know, the world the world needs to be um, physically annihilated. So, so it's like the end of the world as we know it, so to speak, the way it functions, the way it operates? Yes, I guess you could say that. And, you know, it's not always entirely clear whether it's simply a matter of who the ruling powers will be or whether nature will somehow be transformed. I mean, that seems to be, you know, going back as far as Isaiah, that seems to be an idea about what will happen in, in the last days. But many of the apocalypses aren't really explicit about that. But yeah, I think you can imagine a somewhat more, less catastrophic apocalypse than, um, than maybe uh, the popular view. So, how does that function together? Because again, I, I, this is going to be an episode where I bring probably a lot of my baggage from my childhood in. But Because um, w- one of the things that I think was pretty prominent was that all of these apocalyptic pieces fit together to make one giant end times story, right? So, you have these pieces of Isaiah, and we got to put that together with these pieces of Daniel. And if you can kind of crack the code, so to speak, you can put together this mosaic of what the end times will look like. And then we can sort of backfill and, and kind of figure it out from there. And so, we can all see the signs of the end times. And, and you know, Revelation is obviously a big part of, it's a bigger puzzle piece. And how did, would these have fit together in the, like, you know, when the when the author of or compiler of, of Revelation is putting this together, how would it have fit with Isaiah and Daniel? And yeah, I'm just curious how that, how that would have happened. So, well, so that's a really good. That's a great way of of sort of of thinking about it. And I mean, I actually think Revelation is you know tremendously influential because it becomes part of the canon, but um, it's also quite distinctive and in some ways really unusual apocalypses typically do draw on earlier traditions, but Revelation, I think, you know, just the uh, the way it uh, makes use of prophetic, of the language of prophets, of, of Ezekiel and Isaiah, um, and, and at its use of Daniel, I mean, I think they're really more, more almost than any other apocalypse I can think of, um, the language is just so uh, profoundly indebted to earlier prophets. And I think actually, I mean, my own view is that um, John is, 
you know, he does, we, we think that when he calls his book Apocalypse, you know, Revelation, he's he's entering it in this new genre. But I think he really wants to represent himself as a prophet. You know, he he sees himself standing in the same tradition as um, Isaiah and Ezekiel, and I think for him, Daniel was also. Uh, mm. a prophet. So, I think he's creating his picture of, of the end of days, drawing on what, yes, what for him are, you know, authoritative works. And then, of course, as Revelation becomes an authoritative work, you're right, it becomes yet another element of this, um, of, of, of the schema that um, that Christians particularly will, will yeah. draw on. So, uh, and you mentioned Isaiah a couple of times, and th- in the context of an a apocalyptic, right? So, here you have, I mean, a biblical prophet, that's a complex book, you know, it's stages and over centuries was, you know, expanded upon and such and such and such. But it, we think of Isaiah as basically a prophet, but there are, you know, there seem to be apocalyptic elements in the book of Isaiah. So, can you expand a little bit on like, uh, what's What's the difference between prophecy and apocalyptic, and why would you have two things like that in the same book? And you know, yeah, no, I think I think it's a really that's a that's a wonderful question, and um, it's a very complicated question. So I hope you know I'll probably forget where I'm going and just pull me back. So, so I mean, one one way of thinking about it is you know prophets have views of how the world is going to end. Prophecy, sort of, at least the prophets who make it into the Hebrew Bible, sort of peters out sometime, you know, not so long after the rebuilding of the Second Temple. It doesn't mean there weren't people running around giving prophecy. But then this other form of revelation seems to emerge sometime in the later part of the Second Temple period. One one difference I think that, you know, that people rightly point to when it comes to thinking about this, you know, this coming end of the world as we know it, is in general, I mean, Isaiah here again is a little bit of an exception, but like if you look at Amos, go back to the very beginnings of prophecy, um, Amos tells you you really shouldn't be hoping for the day of the Lord. It's darkness and not light. Bad things are going to happen. It's going to be disastrous. And really the message is repent and that won't happen. Apocalyptic literature seems to look forward to the coming of the end and you should repent because that will mean you're one of the righteous and you'll get to enjoy the new world that's going to emerge. But it's not it's not telling you to repent so that the end will be postponed. Can I just, just to interrupt, just to have clarity for, I think, timelines here. You mentioned Amos, the beginning of prophecy. So, Amos is like 8th century? That's right. Right, Probably and, and, the, and the, the day of the Lord is not something you want to like, just, just don't, don't go there. But then you mentioned the Second Temple period, and I th- you may have said the late Second Temple period for, um, and not to put words in your mouth, the emergence of apocalyptic, a different way of thinking, or well, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it, that the question of when apocalyptic literature emerges is one question, and the question of when an apocalyptic way of thinking emerges is a different question. Probably those, uh, you know, that more kind of the idea that history is all determined and that there's going to be some kind of major break that we can't do anything about. I think that probably emerges in the later part, maybe in the Hellenistic period, um, you know, we have it in Daniel, so that puts us in the middle of the second century BCE, when exactly, you know, those ideas emerge, I think it's hard to say. But, um, can you take a stab at why they emerge? So, I, I think one one possibility is that the political circumstances are sufficiently different, that that idea that, you know, repentant things will get better, which is meaningful in a period when the people of Israel um, enjoyed sovereignty and lived in their own land. Um, n- now, you know, when they've been living under f- foreign imperial rule for a long time, that, you know, the, it seems as if history is heading in a particular direction and it's not a good direction and all that can change things um, is for for God to intervene in some way. They don't have a king anymore. They don't have an army. So, they need God to, you know, bring history uh, to an end. Um, I think that's probably a part of it. Um, Some recent scholarship has argued that it's 
that an important component of this is that the Seleucids had a new way of thinking about time, that the Seleucids, uh, the, so this, the Hellenistic dynasty um, that came to rule uh, Palestine from the beginning of the second century BCE, uh, that, that this dynasty, Seleucus was one of Alexander's generals, and when Alexander died, his em- empire got divided up among his generals. Um, Seleucus, uh, the dynasty Seleucus founded um, at, the, at the beginning of the, um, of the third century, at the end of the fourth, beginning of the third century BCE, um, had a particular attitude toward time. It began counting time from Seleucus's um, ascendancy, and it just kept counting. It didn't go reign by reign by reign. So it, it represented itself as something new, and that maybe apocalyptic literature is a kind of response to that. You know, you have your time, well, we have a different kind of time. I'm, I'm not sure I'm persuaded by that, but it's what I, what I think is useful about that is it reminds us, you know, that these ideas emerge both in, in, um, in the context of ancient Judaism and later ancient Christianity, but that there's a larger world out there as well, which has an impact on it. Precisely what the impact is, I wish I, I, wish I could tell you. Well, one thing I think that's important in that, you know, one implication of that is we've talked about Isaiah and Daniel and almost like these proto-apocalyptic, they're not fully developed in that way. And then we have Revelation, which seems to be very sophisticated and then there's this whole time period in between, the Second Temple period, where there are books that didn't make it into our canon that look very similar to some of these other books. Um, there were other apocalypses that were being written during this time. Would that be fair to say? And what, what are some of those that maybe we wouldn't have heard of? Okay, well, so let, let me, I, I, would, I would want to make one um, adjustment to what you said. That is, critical scholars would, would tell you that Daniel was was as composed. I mean, Daniel has probably earlier material in it, but that it takes the form in which we have it now, probably right during the Maccabean revolt. So, that's actually, we can, we can date it. If, you know, if you're skeptical about its ability to prophesy, um, if you think that it, key, it gets historical events right up to a certain point, and then it doesn't seem to get them right. Um, you can date it pretty precisely to the middle of the Maccabean Revolt. So that would put it um, in the 160s. So it's BCE. more squarely into so that, that Second Temple period. It just is one that got in the canon. That's hmm. that's right. And it's a very interesting question why it got in the canon. When it now turn, it looks like it may be the earliest work we would identify as an apocalypse that's primarily concerned with the end of history. But it's not the earliest work that people have, you know, usually talked about as an apocalypse. I mean, let me let me talk about, you know, a great favorite of mine, um, now, which is not maybe not the earliest apocalypse, but it's certainly the it has it has some claim to be called that, and an extremely influential text, and that's the Book of the Watchers. Um, it survives or it's passed down um, as part of the Ethiopic book um, of First Enoch. But it's also preserved um, in you know, quite fragmentary form in Aramaic among the Dead Sea Scrolls. But those Aramaic fragments allow us to be pretty confident that it's a little bit earlier than Daniel. And we've got some Greek for it also, so we're not just dependent on a significantly later translation. And what, what's really interesting to me about it is, you know, there's some, some interesting points of contact with Daniel. You know, the famous throne vision in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel sees the Ancient of Days seated on his, on his fiery throne. There's a description of Enoch ascends to heaven and he sees God enthroned, the great glory he calls God enthroned. And the description is very close. And I don't, I don't think that Daniel was using the Book of the Watchers, but they, they appear to have a source in common there, a poetic source probably. But this is a, a book that involves in part a retelling um, or a, a set of traditions about those sons of God who marry daughters of men and all sorts of bad things happen um, and in, in Genesis 6. And Genesis 6 just sort of gestures at them. But the Book of the Watchers tells their story in much more detail. And then it has Enoch ascend to heaven where he sees God enthroned and he gets to talk to God pretty much face to face. And then he takes a tour of the cosmos and a, a tour of the, of the world, of the earth, really. I mean, it's, he sees 
cosmological phenomena, but he's he's on on the earth. He goes to parts of the earth no human being but he has ever seen um, in the company of angels. So he's obviously got some kind of angelic status, which, you know, might remind you of Isaiah back in um, chapter six of Isaiah, when Isaiah sees God enthroned in the temple and God needs a messenger and Isaiah volunteers, you know, all those angels around him, but Isaiah um, gets to to take the message. So there's like an otherworldly dimension to apocalyptic too. You know, it's 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 the end of you know, it's the end of the system of of the age, so to speak. But and there's a glimpse into a different kind of reality. Yes, and the Book of the Watchers, I think, is much less concerned with the end of the age mm-hmm. than it is with that different reality. I mean, one of the things that really um, I find so fascinating about the Book of Revelation is that for all, I mean, people tend to be focused on its interest in the end, but it's full of that kind of other reality. I mean, John is watching what's going on in the heavenly temple. He's watching the liturgy of the heavenly temple. And even those events on earth are have, you know, an impact on the heavenly temple. I mean, so I think it's, you know, there really are some very, um, it's, it's not a work that's concerned only, I mean, for all its interest in the end, that's not all it's concerned with. Well, I think that's really important. And, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I also think of I remember reading Brueggemann's commentary on Jeremiah, and that really stood out that, you know, within prophecy, we often think of that as telling a future, kind of time-distant reality, but often it's, a, in their mind, kind of more of a spatial, spatially distant reality. It's mm-hmm. what's happening right now, but it's happening in the heavenly realm. And is that mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. one thing that ties prophecy and apocalyptic together is they're both trying to wrestle with the spiritual reality of what's happening physically right now? Yes, I think that's right. And I think you might say that, um, you know, apocalyptic literature kind of makes that more kind of material or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you think of Daniel chapter 10 when Gabriel appears to Daniel and tells him, well, I was um, busy trying to uh, fight off the Prince of Persia, the Prince of Greece, and uh, but I had to come talk to you, so I sent Michael to do, Michael agreed to take over for me so I could come and talk to you. So, clearly, conflict between nations on earth is understood as the earthly counterpart of conflict that's taking place in the heavens, and each nation has its prince, it's angelic embodiment. Representative. Representative, that's Mm -hmm. right. So, I mean, I think the, you know, the difference between the way modern people look at the world or the way the apocalypses look at the world is the apocalypses think the really important action is taking place in heaven. You know, what what our armies on earth are only going to be as successful as the as the angels slugging it out in heaven. Whereas to go back to, to prophecy, I don't think most prophets would put it in quite such concrete terms. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, you rightly said it's a kind of spiritual reality and a, a physical reality on earth. In some of the apocalypses, that spiritual reality has become very mm, concrete. Yeah. Which is maybe something you would expect kind of at the end of the age where these worlds begin to meld? Yes, maybe. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, this um, maybe raises the question of the role of angels. You know, angels certainly are present in the Hebrew Bible, and they do, you know, I was talking about a moment ago about that passage in Isaiah, they certainly play a role uh, in in prophecy, but I think they play an even larger role in apocalyptic literature. And, you know, some, I mean, the the old thing to say was, uh, you know, the the, the 19th, early 20th century thing was to say it's because, um, you know, for ancient Jews, God had come to seem so distant and I think, you know, there was a sort of covert, um, not so covert view that, you know, that, and that's why we needed Christianity to fix mm-hmm. this problem. Um, I, you know, I actually think you could argue the other way about all these angels. All these angels are a way of saying, you know, the divine world is very accessible. There are a lot of angels around and you can have contact with them. And in fact, the boundaries, not for ordinary people so much, but for, for great figures, you know, heroes like Daniel and Enoch, they get to have conversations with angels. Um, Enoch gets to go through the heavenly temple and stand before God, where even the angels are scared to go. So there's something also a very 
um, uplifting for human beings to feel that they're able to have these con you know, these conversations with angels, um, that the angel tells John, you'll know better than I, a chapter 19, don't call me Lord, I am your fellow servant, you know, so um, human beings really can achieve the same, you know, status as angels. So that I think, I think you could actually flip it and say, you know, the multiplication of angels um, should be read as a kind of a sign of the nearness of, of the divine. Stay tuned for more Bible for Normal People. Hey everyone, just a few things that you may not know about the Bible for Normal People. One, did you know that we have a YouTube channel where we post regular videos? Sometimes we answer questions, sometimes we ask questions, sometimes we just look pretty in front of the camera. We have videos up on all things Bible-y, scholarship so check it out. You can go to youtube.com front slash C front slash the Bible for Normal People. Also, another way to engage our community and the things that we do, if you're a normal person who reads the Bible... Chances are you have questions, and we often will reply to them. So you can submit a question that we may answer in a podcast, blog post, video on our site. Uh, We'll do this whenever we feel like it or when God tells us to. So just head to thebiblefornormalpeople.com and click the Ask button in the top right-hand corner. You can also vote up questions that other people have asked. Hi everyone, Matt Stein here from Hernando, Mississippi, and a member of the Producers Group here at The Bible for Normal People. I encountered the podcast while working through my own faith deconstruction journey and after reading one of Pete's books. I found the episode so helpful that I wanted to find a way to show my gratitude. I was happy to discover that for as little as $1 per month, anyone can support the production of the podcast. And not only that, Pete and Jared throw in all sorts of great additional goodies as well. If you'd like to show your support, head on over to patreon.com slash the Bible for normal people. We'd like to give a special thanks to our producers group, a great group of folks that give a portion of their time to providing feedback and ideas to Pete and Jared to help make the podcast even better. So thanks to Joshua Edson, Nick Dahm, Lee Ray Mercado, Clinton, Megan Hood, Sam Oldham, Clyde Howell, Steph, and Rebecca DeFord. And now, back to the podcast. So, okay, so we have, in the New Testament, we have an apocalyptic book, you know, the book, so-called, the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic. Um, But I I guess what's striking me is that there are apocalyptic elements, maybe, not to overstate, maybe throughout the New Testament. And maybe, can we talk about that a little bit, just to, because there are things that, might be might make more sense to readers of the New Testament if they're aware of the apocalyptic background to some of these things. So, do you, I mean, do you want? Do you have anything that you want to comment on? Anything come to mind immediately about that? Well, I mean, for sure. I mean, I think the whole, you know, the whole from I mean, what one could easily use the word apocalyptic to understand the whole, you know, scenario of the. Of the Christian narrative, that is, you know, that's a, a story about God and Jesus taking actions that are ultimately going to lead to a new age. I mean, that's that's certainly apocalyptic in some in some sense. And you know, this just goes to the um, the different, you know, the the scholarly interest in defining a genre of apocalyptic. You know, the Book of Revelation looks from a literary point of view, very different from the Gospels, but the content of the Gospels certainly could be described as apocalyptic um, from, you know, from, from many points of view. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a different model, I think, for, for people who are reading the New Testament, for many people, that to think about how pervasive this idea of apocalyptic is. I mean, isn't one of the ways of describing Jesus was to call him an apocalyptic prophet or something, an apocalyptic preacher, or... That seems to be sort of central to what he was all about. Not, not. Sim- I guess again, I don't want to drive too sharp a wedge. That not necessarily between apocalyptic and prophecy. But if Jesus was a sort of a prophet, it's a, he's an apocalyptic kind of prophet. Yes, ab- uh-huh. absolutely. Or you think of John the Baptist. I mean, that's you know certainly that uh, that kind of preaching that repent because. Um, the kingdom of God is coming really soon, and you're repenting not to make it 
not come and to have God change his mind. You're repenting so that when it comes, you will be, you know, judged um, as one of the righteous. Yeah. Yes, and, I and, think that's, and not to state yeah, the obvious, and, but let's do it anyway. Um, this is a really good maybe example for why understanding Jesus and the New Testament is more than just sort of poking our noses in portions of the Hebrew Bible. There's also this development of the idea of an apocalypse or apocalyptic genre that seems to be so foundational to to a story that, you know, people read in church on every Sunday and and we just sort of read these words, but when you look at them historically, there's a there's a background to some of the stuff that Jesus says and and I guess Paul too. I mean, where do you where do you see an apocalyptic element in Paul, or is that just all over the place too? Like like in the gospel? Yeah, no, I think I think I think it's yeah. all over the place. I mean, I'm always. I mean, it seems to me, you know, as a you know, my reading of Paul, um, you know, it, 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 it seems to me that he's really expecting the world to end any day now. Um, you know, very very soon. He also, I mean, I think. You know, one of the things that, that I think is interesting, and maybe this is more more surprising to people coming at this material from the direction of ancient Judaism than for people, you know, raised in the Christian tradition. But, you know, I think there's sometimes a, a feeling that, you know, the the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels, the more human Jesus is more in keeping with Jewish expectations. But I actually think that's not true at all. If you look at Daniel, is there a Messiah in Daniel? Not so clear that there's a human Messiah. I mean, there's, there, you know, Michael seems to be some kind of that son of man mm-hmm. figure, whoever, whoever that is. So I, you know, I, I, I think that's, you know, Paul's, um, you know, if you can use this of, of Paul, his, his very high Christology, you know, his view of, you know, a really exalted Christ and revelation as well. I mean, I, you know, it's become, if I can, I don't know if this is of interest to, to, to you, but you know, it's, it was very popular when I was in graduate school to talk about Paul as, you know, one of the most important writers we have from Jewish writers of the first century. You know, how many, how many Jewish writers that we know by name do we have from the first century? Very few, and Paul is one of them. I think that's absolutely right, and Paul should inform what we think about first century Judaism. But I think that's even more true of the book of Revelation. I mean, you know, as I read the book of Revelation, John is someone who parts company with Paul. He thinks purity laws actually are important. I mean, I, I take him to be, you know, not, not just coming out of Jewish tradition, but to be, you know, not to be convinced that you should really get rid of mm-hmm. all that stuff the way Paul seems to be. So, um, I think Revelation is very important for, under, you know, to, to flip your question. I mean, yes, obviously to understand um, earliest Christianity, you need to understand um, ancient Jewish apocalyptic expectations. But I would flip it and say that, you know, early Christianity gives us some very good evidence for what um, ancient Jews thought. Yeah, and and I guess that's a really interesting observation about the difference between the book of Revelation and Paul and, and, and the question of purity, and I'm sure other things as well, as a reminder that there are different kinds of Judaism in the first century that are shaping themselves around this Jesus person, this leader, uh, their Messiah, but they still, they're still still picking up maybe on different strands of Jewish traditions, which was diverse. And, and I guess so, it shouldn't surprise readers of the New Testament to see that kind of theological diversity embedded into the pages because they they were not always looking at things the same way. No, I, I that that seems exactly right and of course, you know, there are um there were all kinds of other, you know, uh, factors, influences, um uh, cultural culture that has an impact on on the New Testament, but I think you're I think that's exactly right that um even the the the, the Jewish materials are, you know, are very yeah. varied. Well, uh, can we um Another thought is coming to my mind here, and that is the, I guess, the role of the afterlife in all of this. And is is it is first of all is it accurate to say that a part of apocalyptic thinking involves afterlife thinking as well? Um, yeah, that's a really that's a great 
question on the book. I mean, if you try to ask the question, um, where does a belief in reward and punishment after death emerge in ancient Judaism? You know, if you read, um, it seems to me, if you read most of, um, you know, pre-Second Temple Hebrew Bible with an open mind, you know, there is, it's certainly not that they think, um, you know, people cease to exist at death, but it doesn't sound like there's reward and punishment. There's Sheol, and it doesn't sound like it's a great place to be. Um, and I guess if you're lucky, you get gathered to your to your ancestors, um, and maybe that's a more pleasant form of, of Sheol. Um, so when does that idea emerge? And I think it's, you know, hard to say exactly when, but in the Book of the Watchers, so probably at the be- end of the third, beginning of the second century, Um, When Enoch is taking his tour to the ends of the earth, one of the things he sees are some hollows in which souls are stored waiting for the last judgment. So the souls are kind of on hold until the last judgment. But there's one one hollow has a fountain and light, and that's presumably for the good Mm. souls. So that's a kind of way of integrating these things. And this is certainly something that later Jewish tradition struggles with, how to relate Um, the world to come, as they call it, you know, life after death to the days of the Messiah. Um, So the Book of the Watchers has a a kind of solution. Daniel, a little later, um, has a very kind of limited sense of of resurrection there. I mean, uh, um, many of those who sleep in the dust will awake, some to everlasting life and some to eternal reproach. So some of, some some people are going to get resurrected and some of those, and you would might think only good people would, but it sounds like some good people will and some uh-huh. bad people will. And that's really curious. And I guess one way of making sense of it is to say that, you know, the Maccabean revolt means martyrdom. That means people dying precisely for their loyalty to the Torah. So that creates a situation in which you need to imagine that there's some kind of reward for them. It's not, you know, it's, I'm sure it was obvious to people from earliest days that, you know, bad things happen to good people and good people don't always have good lives. But, you know, the, the experience of the Maccabean persecution made that particularly evident. So it may be that the idea is if you were a good person and you le- lived to a ripe old age and had a good life, you don't need to get resurrected. And if you're a bad person and you came to a bad end, you don't need to get resurrected. But the people who didn't get their just desserts, I'm, I'm really not sure what to make mm-hmm. of that. And it's kind of surprising to me that um, it's not more developed there. But you know, within within the next century or so, the idea really takes off. And you can certainly see that in the New Testament, where I think, you know, come, I mean, it's, uh, it's an idea that um, ancient Jews, um, I think, probably contributed to ancient Christians and share with them. So, um, again, I'm, I'm trying not to oversimplify, but uh, what I'm hearing you say is that this whole idea of reward and punishment in the afterlife, it's hard to pin like a, a particular cause that might develop that, but persecution seems to be something you're saying it seems to have a role in that. God has to have something better than this. Yes, I, that may be. Okay. I mean, another thing people have played with is, you know, when when the Jews met the Greeks, you know, and the at least some strands of Greek tradition, the Platonic tradition and other strands think that the soul is immortal, that maybe that gave some kind of impetus. I mean, I, I don't think it's a borrowed idea, but there might be things that, encourage the growth of the idea. And again, I, it's not that I think that, you know, the earliest literature do, thinks that, you know, has a kind of naturalistic, you know, death is the end view, but I don't think it's, you know, th- it's not reward and punishment. That That is a, a later development and it may have to do with persecution, but um, it's not, it's, you know, you, you would like Daniel to be much more explicit about that if you're going to, if you were going to go that road. So, I want to maybe go back a little bit big picture and can you say again, maybe more about the function of apocalyptic. So, I would assume as, as a piece of literature, as something that's being passed around and read and, and passed down, there's some value here to a community that's beyond the imagery and, you know, painting a historical picture of the end of the world or end of the age. So, what's the real function for why this would have flourished at this particular time? Yeah, well, I think it continues to flourish. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I've done a lot of work on a, 
on the Jewish, I don't want to call it an apocalypse because I don't think it knows that there is such a thing as an apocalypse, but an apocalyptic text written in Hebrew um, in the early 7th century of this era that's all excited because the Persians have reconquered Jerusalem and it's no longer in Christian <laughs> hands. And they think that means, you know, the Messiah is coming or the two Messiahs are coming any day now. And they prophesy all this um, in, you know, in the 620s and they have no idea that, you know, Pretty soon, Jerusalem isn't going to be in Persian or Christian hands, but in Muslim hands. They don't know their own. So it's an ongoing thing. It is, I think, true among Christians as well um, that you're, that this literature doesn't go away. So I think, I mean, which all the more says it right. fills some kind of need. Um, and I, I think the need, look, the, the predictive part, I mean, if you're a good enough interpreter, you can make anything work, you know, in an ongoing way. I mean, the predictions, the times can all have passed, you know, the, there's a great apocalypse called Fourth Ezra from shortly after the destruction of the Second Temple. And he has a vision of the four beasts from the sea that picks up on Daniel's vision, but the last beast is an eagle. And God says to Ezra, you know, I didn't tell your brother Daniel about this, but the fourth beast is this eagle is actually the Romans. So, I mean, <laughs> it's not quite, I didn't quite give him the full story. So you can, you can do that, you know, indefinitely. So I think it does fill some other kind of need as well. And I, you know, I, I, I look, apoc I don't think there are any communities that read only apocalypses. They read other things too. What do apocalypses add? I think probably they add some kind of confidence that the end is near, or even if it isn't near, that it's certainly coming. God has promised the end is going to come, and it's going to be an end that will be good for, for us. It will be bad for our persecutors, bad for the you know, the evil empires out there and good for us. And I think also those glimpses of, you know, the other world must be, you know, very inspiring, you know, to have some sense, you know, a, 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 even a glimpse of what that heavenly reality looks like. I think that must be very appealing. I, and, you know, um, not to get political, and I do mean that, but... Um we can understand maybe the appeal of apocalyptic genre throughout throughout history, really for political situations. Maybe in part because of the the uh, the context of political realities of the ancient world that might have given rise to it in the first place. But the us versus them, the powers of light versus the powers of darkness, kind of thing, which you know is in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. That's language that. That's that's around today in America. That hasn't gone anyplace, and and it's easy to sort of people forget the beatitudes really quickly, but we latch on to this either or black and white dualistic thinking, which seems to be and again correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be part of the the property almost of apocalyptic thinking. There are there is a divide here. <laughs> which side are you going to be on? Yes, I think that's right. I think some of this literature, and, you know, again, this is, you know, this is an interesting kind of tension between, you know, the way Judaism develops and the way Christianity develops. Some of the, this literature, um, at least, doesn't really get, doesn't give up on the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, so... <laughs> Um, 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 you know, in one way, so that's particularist, and I think, you know, in the modern world, we like universalism better than particularism, but it's also kind of collective, and it's much less, you know, light and dark. Mm. So, and you can also, you can decide who the people of Israel are. I mean, for early Christians, it was obvious that they were the people of Israel. So, I I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I think you're right that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least the, the most sectarian texts, they hold on to that language of Israel because that's their ancestral language, but it really isn't so meaningful to them anymore. For them, the meaningful distinction is between the righteous who constitute, you know, 0.001 of, you know, the world <laughs> right. and everybody else, which means, yeah. you know, all Gentiles and, you know, that 0.99 point whatever of, of Jews. So um, that's a really kind of radical dualism. I think the, that language, you know, the more kind of communal language, I, you know, I mean, I, I find it more congenial um, because I think it, you know, it allows for, you don't have to, it, it doesn't, it doesn't imagine as radical a difference between 
um, in and out well, that way. Well, and maybe a more charitable, I don't, you can, yeah, correct me here because I'm going to maybe go off on something, but a more charitable reading might actually interpret that as hope. You know, in some ways it's it's the us versus them, but in other ways it's a hope that God will overcome or intervene on our behalf. Yes, it's certainly that. I mean, I think in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you know, at least uh, some of it is a kind of predestinarian view of the world that God has, uh, you know, given everybody his place. You know, you were you were either born to light or born to darkness. So in a way, you know, sort of you can relax and just go down the road. But but of course, I mean, I'm sure this is you know this is true in the Christian tradition as well. Just you know, despite committing to a predestinarian view, um, you know, these uh, theologies always insist that you have to work very hard to. Um, make it clear that you actually belong to the children uh-huh, of light uh-huh. and not the children of darkness. And they struggle with people who look like they were children of light and then they fall away and people who didn't start out there and want to join. So it's always, the reality is always more complicated than that. But I, you know, I, I, I think probably, you know, for me, um, maybe that's, you know, that's the part that I um, you know, personally find the most troubling theologically. I mean, I don't usually um, worry about the theology, you know, the, the, for the personal implications of the, of the theology of texts that I, that I study. That's generally not my interest in them, but I do find that troubling. It doesn't, you know, it seems very unfair to me that you could be predestined to something and then blamed for it. <laughs> okay, good point. Well, Martha, listen, I think we've done the impossible here today. We have exhausted this topic of apocalyptic. There's <laughs> nothing else to say. Don't, wouldn't you agree? We've actually yeah. hit absolutely... No, of course, I'm kidding. We've barely scratched the surface, but I think to do this fully, this might wind up being a 10-hour podcast, right, so which some of our listeners are going to say, please give us a 10-hour podcast in apocalyptic, but mm-hmm. I think we'll have to do that another time. But um, are, are there, for our listeners, are there any like projects you're working on at the moment? Or if they want to if they want to find out more about you, um, is there maybe a, you know, a, a way website, uh, you know, at Princeton or, or someplace where they can find out more about you? Um, you, you can find me um, on the religion department website at Princeton. I have very little web presence, I must confess, for better, for better or for worse. I like to think of it as being a countercultural act on my part. But No, we're um, going to create a Facebook page for you, and people <laughs> are going to be putting all sorts of stuff there. No, we, wouldn't do that. we wouldn't do that to you. That's cool. Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. But um, I... I I um, have written a book called um, The Apocalypse, A Brief History, um, and um, was uh, published by Wiley. And um, I, I must say, I, I think it was published in 2009. Um, it's intended for a general audience. I no longer agree with everything I said there, but I, I mostly agree with it. And um, if someone were looking for something to read, probably of um, that's... You know, that would be a, a good place to start. Uh, yeah. Then, okay, all yeah. right. Yeah, well, you. listen, yeah, Martha, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We had a great time, and uh, it's just such an important topic. And thanks for helping to clarify that for us. Well, thank you. It was it was really fun. Thanks so much. See ya. Thanks for being with us, everyone, for another episode of the podcast. And yeah, if you have a chance to check out Martha's book, The Apocalypse, A Brief History, it's meant to be an introduction to normal people. So yeah, that may be a great place to start to wrap our uh, heads around this really, really important topic. All right. See you next time. See ya. Thanks as always to our team. Executive producer, Megan Kamick. Audio engineer, Dave Gearhart. Creative director, Tessa Stoltz. Marketing wizard, Reed Lively transcriber and community champion Stephanie Spate and web developer Nick Striegel. For Pete, Jared, and the entire Bible for Normal People team, thanks for listening. <laughs>